Thanks, Justin. I'm going to get my Brigham straightener out of here. And while I do that, I'll fill you in a little bit more on my background so you have a bit better idea of why they have asked a logger from Montana to come here. And I'll also get what I had for lunch back where it belongs. I don't know how many of you like to stand up in front of people and talk. It makes me sick. And all the tricks they teach about how to do this and not have stomach churning and sweating like I am right now. I've tried all the tricks and I haven't found one that works yet. I'm imagining all of you naked. <laughs> I don't know if that's going to your stomach. It's not something we're going to do. So what I thought is if I do my outfit in the bio and look back where it belongs. Uh, I am a network. I'm going to talk with you about with vision there is hope. And I'm going to be hoping to share with you a little bit of the story of what's going on in, in my resource culture. And maybe uh, there are some things that you can pull out of that to learn about the journey that you're currently on. I'm a logger. Uh, actually, half the family is in forestry, and the other half is in cattle. We moved to the western part of the United States about 150 years ago. About 100 years ago, part of the family uh, quickly learned that cows don't eat trees. And since we live within our trees, somebody had to do the tree walking. So that became my side of the family. We are the, the forest side. We removed the trees. We live in a little town up in the extreme northwestern corner of Montana. It's up by Glacier National Park, if you've ever visited the states. It's a stunning, beautiful little town of 2,800. And it's very isolated. It's 90 miles to the next town. Our high school mascot is the loggers. We're home of the Libby loggers because forestry is our culture. We have 3 million acres, I don't know what that is in hectares, but we're 3 million acres of national forest, it's public land that surrounds my community. It's not a place to live. We share our ecosystem with a bunch of things that we also enjoy. Grizzly bears and moose and elk and wolves. And that's part of the romance of calling where we live home. Those are the things that I love about the place where I live. The people that started our community had some pretty rough practices. Those are timber barren days that started my town. Timber barren days were essentially cut and run. They started over in the eastern part of America and whacked the trees down in Maine to build Boston. Then they moved to Michigan and whacked trees down to build Detroit. The family that started our town, they whacked all the trees down in northern Minnesota and they looked across the prairies of North America and the next patch of trees is where we live. So they loaded up the sawmill and the community and started our town. The practices were acceptable to the public at that time. The public was very much like the public in the rest of the world, and subduing the wilderness was an acceptable form of business. It helped provide the stuff of life, and people were mostly concerned about that. How are they going to have a home? How are they going to have an economy? Things have changed. This was my job in forestry. I was uh, a sawyer, we, that's what we call a tree cutter. I'm not sure what it's called here. The guy with chainsaw, that was my job. I went to school. I bet, oh, the, our practices have changed quite a bit since the early days, by the way. We're now highly mechanized, like other agricultural pursuits. Our machines cost a half a million to a million dollars a piece, but they've got air conditioned cabs. Uh, the people that are inside there are listening to XM radio and using joysticks. The wide tracks on the bottom of our machines are, are easier on the ground. Our processes are easier on our workers. We're easier on the environment. And we're very proud of that. We, we produce a product. It's not food like you guys do. So we produce a commodity, commodity that people live with. Paper, furniture, flooring, uh, energy pellets. We're very proud of what we do. The, the biggest change, though, is that in the old days, we did the cut and run thing. But about 70 years ago, the family that, the timber barons that started our town, figured out that there was no new patch of trees to move to. So they started a sustainable forestry program for our community. They, they did a 200-year management plan and started planting six trees for everyone we harvested. We planted six because weather would take out a few of them, the deer and elk would eat a couple of them, we hoped one would make it. And we started a sustainable forestry practice that is currently studied by the World Commission on Forestry. So we're very, very proud that we're one of the first areas to start a sustainable forestry initiative. I grew up in this culture, and like yours, one of the things that we share is a deep sense of stewardship and conservation. So 
So I grew up with this deeply embedded in me. I was proud of our heritage. I was proud of where we, we had come from the early days. But I graduated from high school and went to college in Portland, Oregon. And it didn't take very long to be in college to figure out that the kids I was going to school with didn't look at me as a steward. They looked at me as an axe murdering Neanderthals. <laughs> According to them, I was killing the cathedral forest. One of the summers when I was home murdering trees, I met my wife, PJ. Which isn't entirely true. She wasn't my wife when I met her. <laughs> Although I tried that. <laughs> I had been in a logging camp a couple of weeks, and I went to town, and there she was. She had a tube top and a tan, and I said, you're my wife. <laughs> she wasn't. She was a pretty strong little woman, and I'm still scarred from that stupid remark. <laughs> we fell in love, got married. Uh, we were poorly to go to college together, and we learned that we had accidentally manufactured a child. And we learned that it took a lot more logging to go to school than two of our three of us. So we moved to into Spokane, Washington. We moved there to go to college because it was three and a half hours from home. I could go to school Monday through Thursday and Friday, Saturday, Sunday, drive home and log. On one of those weekends home, we accidentally manufactured another child. <laughs> and PJ said, something has got to stop. So I quit school. <laughs> And I, it, we didn't quit either one. It took 10 years and four kids, but we made it through Gonzaga. We got a Bachelor of Science in Civil Engineering, a Master's in Business Administration, got a construction job in that city. It's about 250,000 people. And we were on our career ladder to Yepi them. And one night we were watching the kids play in the yard, and we noticed two really important things. They were playing inside a chain link fence, inside a city. And to this day, we're perpetually pleased that there are hundreds of millions of Americans, and I believe about 80% of your population, it calls urban home. And they love it, and I'm glad they do. But we stayed up all night talking about what we wanted for us and what we wanted for our children. And we made what for us was a quality of life decision. We wanted to raise our family in the rural environment, with clean air, clean water, abundant wildlife, the things I had grown up with. We wanted to raise them in a rural culture, Hard-working, hard-playing, community-oriented, school-oriented, church-oriented people still live in our rural areas. So I, we wanted to raise our family there. So in February 1984, we packed our crap in a U-Haul and we went back to Montana. We were the only loaded U-Haul going into Montana in February. <laughs> That's our winter. And we went back and joined the family logging company. Uh, the family logging company started by mom and dad. Most people, when they think of the timber industry, they think of neighbor businesses. In our country, it's Warehouse or uh, Boise Cascade, big companies. But one of the things that we have in common is 97% of our industry is mom and pop operations. It's small family-owned corporations like ours. And our iteration of Vincent Logging started in the 60s. In the early days of our company, on weekends, us kids and mom would strap coveralls on and hand dad wrenches. The goal was to have the machinery operating Monday morning when dad hit the brush with the crew and mom hit the office attached to the house. They ultimately grew our family operation to include 65 other families. In our town of 2800, that's a big outfit. It's also very isolated, so a lot of more cousins. You know how that works. <laughs> My dad once said that's why rural people wave. You just never know. <laughs> Might be some DNA going by. <laughs> their 65 also included their four boys. I'm the second of four. And we lost mom a while ago, and a few years ago we lost dad. It's on my wife PJ at my side as we try to figure out what we have to hand to the next generation. In fact, I usually I'm out traveling around Jack and my job. PJ came because it's Australia and we love you guys. So she's here, but normally when I'm jacking my job, she's at home doing my work for me, which she says is no big deal. She does it while I'm there. She might as well do it while I'm there. <laughs> and I, I wouldn't be in front of you. I would be home with the most awesome mate on earth, doing exactly what I want to do in the place I'd like to do it with the person I'd like to do it with. But something went wrong in our timber community. And, and the same kind of crossroads as, as animal agriculture is currently facing started happening in our community about 30 years ago. And something was wrong in that discussion. And uh, if everything was okay, I'd be home. But it's not. 
and we share some things in that. I, I want to go over with it. Oh, we'll go back. That's the family now, by the way. Uh, they all still live in Montana. Some of them are in cattle. Some of them are, are in forestry. Some are in, in environmental studies. Uh, that's, that's the family unit. But something is wrong in our rural resource communities. And I want to talk with you about that. And I want to talk with you about how we addressed it and what we all currently face. I want to talk with you about where we are. And this is one guy's version. It's just one guy's version from the ground uh, in, in the back. I want to talk with you about how do we get there, what we do about it, and why if every one of you in Australian agriculture, animal agriculture, work together, why I have more hope now than I did when I first started speaking out 30 years ago. Where are we? We're in rural areas having what I call a collision of visions. We're having a collision of visions with the rest of society because society for the last 50 years has had two things that humans have never had before. Time and money. And what have they been doing with their two weeks of vacation? They've been going out of their urban areas like Sydney and Melbourne and Chicago and Los Angeles and going to our rural areas and vacationing. And what do you know? They're falling in love. They fall in love with the very things that we love about calling our places home. They fall in love with the clean air, clean water, abundant wildlife, the things that they, they have 200 channels on television. They thought these things were gone, but here they are right outside the windshield. It's awesome. We love it. I don't blame them for loving it. They even love our culture. They have no idea what makes us tick, but I can tell you if they're driving through eastern Montana, cattle country, at 85 miles an hour, and they see a cowboy, they'll slide to a stop on the freeway. Oh, how do you work at cowboys? <laughs> What's he do? I have no idea, but you see the hat. They fall in love with what they think we are. But at the end of their two-week summer vacation, they have to go home. And when they leave, they leave with the desire, and it's a desire we fully understand. It's a desire that's fundamental to our stewardship and conservation ethic. It's a desire to protect. They want to save what they think now are the last best places, the last best parts of Australia are where you live, the last best uh, parts of America are where I live. There's a big old book on Montana that's called Montana, The Last Best Place. I don't disagree. But in the States, they started fighting to implement policies to protect us. They had a vision for the last best places, and they started fighting through regulatory reform, judicial activism, legislative reform, and they're imprinting their vision of protection on us. And sadly, their vision has one fatal flaw. There's no provision in it for the last best people. And because of that, the very thing they want to protect is paying the price of their protection. And it's not because they're stupid or ill will. It's because we have a guy named Will Rogers. Have you guys ever heard of Will Rogers? Well, he wants, it's important, he, he made a statement about policy and how things work. And it's important to remember that in both cultures, policy is not dictated by reality. Policy is dictated by the public's perception of reality. And when it comes to the public's perception of reality, Will Rogers once said, it ain't what you don't know that's a problem, it's what you know that ain't so that's a problem. And society as a whole knows a great deal about what, what ain't so in the rural areas that we live and the issues that you grapple with on the ground and trying to provide them with the commodity that you provide. We got to see this up close and personal with forestry. This is a healthy forest, and this is what the public thinks our forests ought to look like all of the time. What they don't understand is that if you went to Montana 15,000 years ago, you know what this looked like? Ice. A mile of ice. There were no trees there 15,000 years ago. We're at the end of the last ice age, which is why I don't argue with people about global warming. It's melting. And it probably wasn't cow farts that did it. <laughs> there are no, the trees have grown back. That is a nice, beautiful forest that we have there. It hasn't been there forever and ever, on man, but there it is. But historically, the Native Americans were managing that forest. They managed it for eons, and they used fire. Now we have a forest that the Native Americans have not been managing for 200 years, and it's sick because it's overstocked. Thousands of acres look like this. It's unhealthy. There are too many trees that should have been killed by intermittent fire. Now we have what's called a fuel problem. We have too much fuel out there. We have a fuel problem, and we can deal with that. We can go out into the forest and selectively harvest some of those tubes of carbon. That's where the tree is, sequestered carbon. 
We can take the sequestered car to a processing plant in town, a sawmill, turn it into a consumable product for a consuming population, and then introduce low ground hugging fire to the forest to kill the little trees, make grass grow, create habitat for the species that we share the ecosystem with. But that isn't what's happening because the rest of society has a different vision for our future. And there's a guy named Jasper Carlton from Boulder, Colorado. He's with the Fund for Animals. Might sound familiar. <laughs> he decided that he wanted all forest management in our national forest to stop. So he filed a lawsuit under our Federal Endangered Species Act. He wanted to protect the species from our actions. The first species he filed a lawsuit representing was a grizzly bear. Made me question his environmental credentials. Because I am on the grizzly bear recovery team. I think it's awesome that we have them there. But I understand one fundamental reality about grizzly bears. They don't eat trees. They eat berries and roots and shrubs and things that come up when the tree crop has been removed. And this is one way to do that. The other method, the method that he thinks the, and the rest of the public backed him on this, was the natural method of management. Uh, he said, by the way, that if that one lawsuit did not stop all forestry, all forest management, that he was going to represent the bank hooking monkey plot or the bastard blacks, the Corlean Salamander, the Northern Caribou. We had 13 lawsuits, and he filed lawsuits until management stopped. Libby, Montana no longer has a sawmill. We have 3 million acres of trees around our home, and we don't have a sawmill for the first time in 100 years. Vincent Logging doesn't employ 65 hours. As I speak, we, we employ none. We've saved some of our logging equipment, though, and we've modified it into firefighting equipment. Because the forest is being managed, just not by man. The forest is being managed by nature. And it's not going as well as the public thought it ought to, because we have too much fuel. And those low fires that should have been burning in our forest now have what's called a fuel ladder. The fire crop climbs up the trees, the little trees, and gets into the crown of the big trees. So now we've got forest management going on like this. That's not good for animals. This is the Bitterroot Valley in Montana. Those are elk and they're having a very bad day. <laughs> it's awfully hard to get tourists to come to Montana in the summer when that's the backdrop to the postcard place. We're having a wreck. Sadly, during that wreck, my industry lost its social license to operate, and that's the biggest thing we have in common. We only operate with the consent of the public. That is what your social license is. And in my public land areas, the public said, no, we don't like your practices, we don't like what you're doing, and they, they regulated our license away. We lost it. Because of that, we're crossing what I think is a thin line between environmental sensitivity and environmental insanity. There is something wrong in our rural areas, particularly when the professional litigants have more to do with what's going on than, than professional resource managers. Especially when the public is in love with this important issue of the environment, but willing to get important information on this important issue from such noted experts as Dr. Meryl Streep. She pretends for a living they had her in Congress testifying on agrochemistry issues. What is she doing there and what are they doing listening to her? Dr. Woody Harrelson, did you see him last summer? CNN was interviewing him on Redwood Forest because he was hanging upside down from the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco. And they were interviewing him like he was an expert. He's a pot smoking loon. <laughs> and Dr. Ted Turner, just because he wants to own the stinking satellite, that doesn't make him an expert on whatever bounces off of it. But when these folks view their misinformation, disinformation, pseudoscience, half-truths at an unknowing public, and the media prints that crap as the truth, that's what we made public policy on. And what kind of lens does society have to run this stuff through to test it for truth? Do they have your lens, my lens, ground-based lens? No, they don't. They've got 50 years of Disney movies under their belt. They got Bambi on their mind. They think before you showed up in Australia, wolves were raising orphan rabbits in the Sea of Old Road. <laughs> they have no idea that in the real world, the wolf eats the rabbit. They don't have a party right after that. <laughs> but they have been sold this Disney-esque ecotopia, this harmony and balance that really has never before existed. But, and at the 20-minute mark of every single Disney movie, what happens? 
there's butterflies flitting in a beautiful green field until the bad guy shows up. And who's the bad guy in every single Disney movie? Man. Man is icky. Man is the anti-environmentalist, anti-harmony, anti-balance. Nature is good, man is evil. Fifty years of that. They perfected the argument over the last uh, 10, 15 years. So it's not just any man is truly icky. Capitalist man is truly the icky one. Uh, what, have you watched Perm Gilly? Did you see Avatar? I mean, the, holy cow, we are awful. How many of you saw the World Trade Organization riots in downtown Seattle? When they had that first meeting there, they had the riots. That was brought to you by the Rainforest Action Network from the U University of Montana. Like we have a lot of rainforest in Montana to protect. <laughs> Anyways, they were telling the USA Today to walks through a Starbucks window, they proclaimed capitalism to be the greatest threat to our planet. That was a shock to every developing country in attendance. Because if you get outside the rich borders of our two countries, reality hits you in the face. The leading degrader of planet Earth is not profit, it's poverty. When poverty is driving some nations plus the environment's way in the back behind food, clothing, shelter, the basic human rights, they're not debating view sheds in Zimbabwe. They're talking about food tomorrow night. And sadly, in my country, we've lost that concept completely. We've forgotten that e ecology and economy came from the same Greek root word, oikos. It means house. The inside of our house is our economy. The outside is our ecology. They're joined at the hip. If we don't have a healthy environment, we can't have a healthy economy. But if we don't have a healthy, vigorous, profit-making economy, we don't have the economic luxury of caring for the environment. We're having this debate in both our countries because we're rich enough to. Well, my country's forgotten that. And we run the risk right now of being the biggest threat to the global environment through the misguided lockup of our own. Because we want to consume, it's just production that we don't like. We want things like nice, wide highways. It's just gravel crushing that's icky. We don't like asphalt plants. We just want a road. We like it to be wide and smooth and safe. We don't like gas. We like it to be cheap. It's just oil pumping that we don't like. We like energy. We like it to be immediate at the switch. It's just power plants we don't like, coal plants we don't like, nuclear plants we don't like. They're fighting windmills now because the bird might get, and we just want power. And we like it to be cheap. We love our food. We love it to be abundant. We love it to be pretty. We want it to be cheap, and we want it to be safe. It's just soil management, nutrient management, pesticide management. Those are the things that are kind of icky. They want their McDonald's burger. They don't want to be killed. They love their wood products. It's just stumps that suck. There is a thin line between environmental sensitivity and environmental insanity, and we cross the line. And my country could be the biggest threat to the global environment through misguided lockup of our own. Because we want to consume, but we don't want to produce. So we're driving production into developing countries that are long on resources, long on population, and short on cash. We'll import raw products from them. They'll send us our stuff using methods we were using 30 years ago. And we'll call it green because we don't have to look at the production process. That's insane. How did we get here? I go back to the 60s. How many of you remember the 60s? Yeah. I, when I asked that question in California, I remember part of 1967. Actually, that's my entire generation. We, we might not have inhaled, but we ate the entire plate of brownies. That's what happened to us. And now we're in leadership. What, what's important for our rural areas though, globally is in the 60s we got television and we pushed the boob to close enough to the, the dining room so that we could watch the evening news while we ate. And in the States for the first time uh, you, you could see what was going on in real time someplace without being there. I was a kid in Montana when the Cuyahoga River caught on fire and burned for a week through Cleveland, Ohio. I don't know if any of you have ever seen pictures of that but I remember it. I was just a kid in Montana, but I remember looking at the tube thinking the rivers should not burn their bridges up. You didn't have to live in Michigan to know that the Great Lakes were dying. Because the fish, we got to see them swimming wrong side up every night. Together we got to see the Los Angeles airshed turn purple in the evening. 
Neptune and the eyeballs are a humanoid in a spaceship almost to the moon. We got to see our little blue ball called Earth by distance, and it was kind of bobbing along in blackness. What happened in the 60s is we figured out we have one planet. We're only getting one planet. And some of the stuff we were doing to it needed to stop. We joined in factor and spirit the social movement, the environmental movement. It was designed to empower us to get laws on the books to take care of this place we call home, Earth. In the States, if a group didn't exist, we started one. I was the leader of the first Earth Day in Putney, Montana. We cleaned up the garbage in the crib going by the middle school. A friend of mine, a lawyer son from Vancouver Island, Canada, was getting his forest ecology doctorate at the University of British Columbia. He didn't like atom bombs dropping on the bikini at all. So he and a friend started Greenpeace. Good, well-intended groups that were empowered to get laws on the books. And in my country, we've got a couple dozen major pieces of legislation, good laws like the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, the Endangered Species Act. The Public Video Sustained Yield Act, good, well intended laws. But the movement we empowered and the laws that came out of it are going 40, going on 50 years old, and they're both showing their age. Globally, they're now showing their age. The laws that we had in our country were to be a promise to our population, not a threat to it, particularly our producing population. Right now in the States, the farmers are dealing with clean water issues that are driving them out of business. It was to be a promise, not a threat. The Endangered Species Act was to protect species. It wasn't supposed to be a social engineering tool for a lunatic from Colorado to smear my little town off the map. And the movement we empowered, the movement's alive. It moved off the streets and into our homes. The movement's in your home. It's in your business. It's in your range. It's what you do every day. Decisions you make today. Think back 40 years to Earth Day number one. Think of the, the processes that you use in your production regime right now that weren't even considered 40 years ago. That's the real movement. It's incrementally learning when you come to Beep Australia and attend the seminars, learning how to do a little bit better job of taking care of the earth while you provide this product for your society. Those incremental moves, that's the environmental movement. It's the EcoBoost engine you have in your Ford. Anybody have an EcoBoost engine? That, I captained it in some of your machinery. Cap got together with Shell. They now make an engine that if you park it in the Los Angeles basin, the air going in is dirtier than the air coming out. That's the environmental movement. Incrementally doing a better job of taking care of home while we provide stuff for the human race. It's when you decide whether you want paper or plastic for a bag. It's when you decide to buy a car that gets a little bit better mileage. That's the real movement. It's alive. How many of you have ever had a bumper sticker, Every Day's Earth Day for a rancher? In, in the States, we have Every Day's Earth Day for a farmer, Every Day's Earth Day for a logger. We also have Earth First, we'll walk the rest of the planets later, but we don't wear that one as much. <laughs> I'm proud to say the movement is doing very well. Some of the leaders of the old movement, though, they learned some critical lessons in the 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s. They learned they could make a lot of money marketing one product, and the product they learned to sell wasn't conservation and stewardship. Some of the leaders of the global movement learned that they could sell here and make billions. They took what was a social movement of common cause and turned it into a business of crisis and conflict. I call it the eco-conflict industry. And they're very, very good at what they do. They, they're back to the tube. They're selling their discussion to the, to the society that's very concerned about the environment. And they use two 20-second sound bites when they take a complex issue and boil it down and present it to the public. And now, instead of just coming on our tube, we get it on our smartphone, we get it on our iPad, we get it on our computer screen. We get this discussion. And they use visual backdrops for this discussion that are really important. If they're going to discuss forestry, I know what the visual backdrop for the first 20 second sound bite is going to be. Do you know what the visual for forestry is? What does forest management look like? The world's butt ugliest clear cut. You can see the sucker from the moon. The last three fall into a sea of stumps. That's forestry. If they want to talk to somebody about it, who they get? They get a knuckle dragging Neanderthal from Oregon. He's snooze scribbling down his chin, and he says, God, I like to make stumps, and he's wearing an eat owl t-shirt. You've all seen the guy. 
they get a three-piece suit and tie from Weyerhaeuser, and in front of a 30-story building in downtown Seattle, he says, America wants wood flavor, and by God, we provide it. <laughs> and that's the end of our 20 seconds. The next 20 seconds is somebody who doesn't like forest management. What do they get? They get a bad way to work with a pristine mountain scene, and with the flag in one hand and bald eagle in the other, they say, oh, I want to clean air and water for my children. And then they point out that everybody in that last sound bite are greedy corporate bastards intent on profit alone. And that's the end of the newscast, and society gets to pick. And every resource industry is boiled into those same two simplistic choices. I met here with Andrew to discuss oil with the American people. You ask a fifth grader in America what oil looks like, and they'll begin defining dead black birds in the dead black gulf. Oil is the BP oil spill. The guy doesn't like it, stands in front of the Everglades, flat in one hand, bald eagle in the other. Oil well, wants clean air for water for children. They want to talk about mining the go to Montana, Butte, Montana, one of the worst mistakes we've made in mining ever. Dead birds in a settling pond. Yellow rivers. That's mining. It was made a hundred years ago. But that's mining. And the guy who doesn't like it stands. Agriculture. When they were doing the World Trade Organization discussion, I can tell you it was, it was sad for the American farmer because every time they discussed domestic agriculture, they showed a crop duster. Every single time. American agriculture is the application of chemicals, and the guy who doesn't like it. What about animal agriculture? What do you get in the 20 seconds? In the States, there's a black and white spotted cow with a forklift. You decide it's getting drugged through six inches of manure on a dairy someplace in Northern California. That is animal agriculture. And the guy who doesn't like it, Wayne Pacella with the Humane Society, and he's petting a puppy. All he wants to do is save the puppy. And America gets to pick. You guys have seen the same kinds of things here. I know about your life export issues. They boil it down into, do you want dead cows or not? And those are false choices, and we get angry when we see that. Because we know that's preserve or destroy, and providing for humans is somewhere in between. But that illuminates our issue. Because put yourself in the public shoes for a minute. You get angry. They get concerned. They are four generations from the farm. They don't have Grandma's place in Queensland to go to for two weeks during the summer anymore and watch the cow eat and poop and make milk. They don't have that. And we laughed at them about what they don't know. In the States, we say those stupid people in the city think milk come from, comes from a carton at the supermarket. In the timber industry, we say the dumb people in the don't think boards just show up at Home Depot. And on sale day, a bunch of boards show up. In fact, we felt kind of haughty about what we know and what they don't, because we don't really think we have many legs up on our urban cousin, but we know where their stuff comes from. <laughs> it's not funny anymore, because their ignorance is fertile ground for an industry of conflict that wants to sell this stuff. And they're very good selling it. And those people that are selling it are not our problem. Those groups have a fundamental right to exist. They even have a right to try to make money. Good for them. Our problem is they can sell that crap. Our problem is ignorance. The real enemy is ignorance, the public's and ours. The public's ignorance of who we are and what we do for them and their environment, and our ignorance of the process of leading this discussion and not just fighting it. So what do we do? Uh, the first thing we need to do is address what the public needs. And I think what the public needs is the truth, warts, pimples, and all. We cannot lie. If we lie, we're lying to ourselves. We've got to tell the truth. We need to have a build trust with the public because if we're going to tell the truth, they have to trust the person this is coming from. They have to trust, trust the messenger. We have to have transparency because they have to be able to verify what they think we're telling them. So we need to give them truth, trust, and transparency. Resource communities, what we need to learn, we need to learn how to lead this discussion and not just fight it. We need to lead and not fight it. Uh, forest communities finally learned to lead. And boy, I'll tell you what, it was after a, a long time of fighting. We were very, very good at fighting. When the issues started coming forward and the public was discussing their consent for our operations and our social lessons and we got angry, one of the things we did was we'd attend our quarterly meetings of the Montana Logging Association because we belong, that's why we belong, we're busy working, they're supposed to save our butt. 
And we'd ask Keith Olson, our director, how were things going? What we did was saddle our associations with the impossible job of representing us without us being fully awake. And that didn't go so well. We thought, well, we need to tell the public the truth. So we started standing on street corners and shouting our truth at them. We played what I call reverse jeopardy. We answered all the questions they weren't asking. We told them what we wanted them to know when we should have been taking a step back and asking them, what do, you, what do you want to know? We were talking when we should have been listening. When that didn't go so well, we sued the bastards. We had rights too, after all. It took us a while to figure out we won a first, first few lawsuits, but then we figured out that we were winning in the court of law but losing in the court of public opinion. And ultimately, the court of public opinion defines the court of law. So then we started really losing, and that's when we hit the streets. We had 80 miles of logging trucks bottling up the main freeway between uh, San Francisco and Seattle. Chilled the cities down. We'd show them 15,000 people marching in Portland and Seattle. I was a guy in the lead truck, and I was a guy with the bullhorn. Until we finally figured out that we were the third ring of the three ring circus, and somebody else was taking the gate receipts. We were the tip for the concrete industry path. We drove their story to the front page where they got to ask America, do you want the marching Neanderthals to whack all the trees down, or do you want to send us 20 bucks and we'll save the forest? We became part of their business strategy of conflict. We were making them billions. So we finally backed up. We started learning to lead the discussion. We started listening to the public. We started uh, hearing what they were saying and what they were concerned about. And we crafted a vision for the future of forestry. We got communities to adopt it. We got legislatures to adopt it. It's very general, based on the Earth Summit. It's sustainability, providing for humans today without compromising the next generation's ability to do the same. We crafted some framework around what forestry might look like. We finally got the acceptance of the public, and the Healthy Forest Initiative was adopted by Congress and signed by President Bush. It was the most progressive forest language since by not over a hundred years in America. And it's the life they were home. But since we waited so long and we fought instead of leading, we completely lost our social license. We're now gaining it back a little bit at a time. It's going to take us a while to get it back. In the meantime, that light at the end of our tunnel is a train coming at you. Because the global conflict industry needs a new pinata. The forestry pinata is not selling as well as it used to, and it's been clear to me for the last 10 years the next pinata is going to be anything that has to do with water and anything that has to do with animals. That's agriculture for in the process. So what can you do? Don't repeat our mistakes. You can learn some things, and some of the things we learned the hard way, three truths we learned about leading that I, if you forget everything else I talked about, these are the three things we learned the very hard way. Truth number one. Democracy works, but it's not a spectator sport. How many of you expect your leaders, whether it's in Victoria or your, your state capitals, how many of you expect them to take courageous stands for common sense agriculture? Don't we all expect that? How many of you have ever asked me his name or number? His friend Robbins. Ask yourself this. If we don't have the guts to pound their name in our yard, how can we have the gall to ask them to climb out on a political limb with the illumination of the media? We need to be engaged in the democratic process. If we want policy to change, we need to support policy makers that understand our realities and have the courage to stand for us. And if we don't stand for them, they won't stand for us. We've got to be engaged in the democratic process. It's the finest institution for bloodless revolution ever designed by man to be engaged in. Second truth we learn is when people lead, leaders fall. Your leaders are no different, our leaders are no different than the rest of society. How many of them have a ranching background? And they can see these two extreme choices too. And they think if they are not told that there's there are choices in between, alternatives between preserve and destroy, what are they going to do? If they think that they have to choose between clean water and agriculture, they're going to pick clean water. They should every single time. If they, have to, if they think they have to pick between animal animal abuse and animal welfare, what are they going to pick? 
Let me make the right choice. So what you've got to do is talk to your leaders about the many choices in between. They're no different than the rest of society. You need to talk to them about how you can have a good animal welfare and an animal livestock industry in Australia. Or they will decide that you need to go. Final truth we learn is the world is run by those who show up. There are meetings held every day talking about the future of animal agriculture in Australia. Some people are going to show up like religious zealots. And we can bitch about them or we can plop our butt down next to them and compare visions. We need to be attending to this discussion. And that is the truth. It doesn't mean you have to go to Victoria to attend to this discussion. There are discussions being held in your local community. You need to show up in those. You need to show up in your local schools. I'm going to talk a little bit about that. And then I'm often asked, what kind of tips do I have that you might be able to take home and use? So I worked on the word help. What might help look like? And quote this really quick. Help to me stands for number one. H stands for humanize. You've got to humanize this discussion. Social norms have made it really easy to vilify an industry. Capital I industry is not trusted. How many of you were in the seminar or the symposium yesterday? Did you hear? Industry is not trusted. The talking face of industry is not a believable person, a believable entity for the public at large. Industry has been vilified and they've succeeded in that. We can't win that war. What we've got to do is address society's real or perceived issues. It has to be engaged by humans in human interest terms and any way. We've got to talk to them people to people. This is no longer, it's not a boardroom fight anymore. It's not a fight that's going to be won on the front page of newspapers. It's a fight that's going to be won in living rooms and over backyard fences in human terms. The engagement has to include ambassadors with whom there's an element of trust. And that's you. They still do want to trust the Australian rancher when you're discussing your issues. They want to. And they need you. They don't need a talking head. They need you. Rural cultures need a trusted human face to share the story, and that face is yours. You are best equipped to tell this story, and you're the most believable in telling it. So what okay. When you're telling this story, the first thing we need to understand is we've got to empathize with the public. We've got to understand the express concerns of the public. We have to understand what they think are real issues and then not laugh at them. Think about it. If you were them, put yourself in their shoes for a minute. That's what we didn't do in the timber industry. If you were watching this discussion over live export and you lived in a 30-story high-rise in downtown Sydney and you had one functioning brain cell, you would be moved. No, oh, that's not nice. <laughs> Thankfully, they live there, but they're very intelligent people trying to make very difficult decisions on a very complex issue. Put your shoes or put your feet in their shoes for a minute and ask, what would you do? So you, when you listen to the public, listen very closely to what they believe the real issues are and what solutions are acceptable to them. They're the ones that give you the consent to operate, so you have to also ask them, what do they think ought to be going on? What's acceptable to the public? Then you need to, I believe, engage in and transmit environmental and food safety initiatives. That's on the farms, in the home, clean air and water efforts, animal welfare efforts, individual and industry-wide regulatory initiatives. Embrace them, make them your own, own them, and then transmit what you're doing to the public. They want to know that you've heard them, that you care, that you're doing something. Your message to assure the public is that I am listening, I understand, I respect, sometimes you might even share uh, your concerns, and I am part of the answer to your concerns. And you will not maintain your social license to operate unless you get to that last part. You have to be part of the answer to the public's concerns. When you can get there, then you will, be, uh, you will maintain your license. Yesterday I watched CORE, you got the grocery stores here, CORE. They talked about their discovery journey on sustainability. In the middle of their discovery journey, they had the World Wildlife Fund. Interesting to me that that was part of their development. I think someday, you guys need to be there. Ag Force needs to be there. The MLA needs to be there. Uh, the Cow Council needs to be there. You need to be part of the answer that they are seeking if you want to maintain your social license. 
Many of you empathize with the public and hope to educate them. You don't play reverse jeopardy. You don't answer the questions they're not asking. Answer the questions they seem to be asking. Listen and identify the individual and societal questions and concerns, then communicate the answers to those perceived needs in English. Don't throw a white paper at them. We did a lot of that. We have the scientists who you need science, you need academia, you need research. But whatever we do, we have to be in English. Oh. That's all. <laughs> Lead locally. Your home area needs an ambassador. Don't overlook the need for it. We, st we started this and we thought, we got to talk to the people in New York and Chicago. And that's, holy cow, that's a mountain we couldn't figure out how to climb. Don't try to climb that. You don't have to worry about Sydney and Melbourne until you worry about your local area. Your family, your friends, your local leaders, your local media, your local schools. Share your story with them first. They then become your ambassadors to the outside. So don't worry about the big city until you worry about your small town. Uh, the P in HELP stands for participate. I ask all rural people to add one line item to your business plan. And I wish in forestry we would have put it right in front of equipment maintenance because we'd have more equipment to maintain. Activism, advocacy, doing something. And when I told my dad we had to become activists, I got a little back like I just got from you. It was the middle of the winter and that's when we weld on our machinery and dad was out welding on a dozer. Jasper piled his first lawsuit and shut a third of our forest down and I went out with the paper and I said, hey, father old person. He stood up and he was loving it up and he took the smoke and rod in his hand and I said, dad, we're going to survive, we're going to have to become activists. And look on his face was yours. He was thinking, throw a hair in my butt and smoke pot? <laughs> Maybe we should just have the option, you know? And that is what activism is. It's not USA Today boxes through a Starbucks window. It's taking one hour out of your week as doing as part of doing business. Not out of your family time, not out of school time, not out of church time. Business. Doing business one hour a week, attending a, a council meeting going to your chamber of commerce, going into a school, answering the letter to the editor, doing something one hour a week. So the tools that didn't work for you, you've got lots of things already invented that we didn't have 30 years ago in the timber industry. If we had all the tools that you've got for you right now, we would have lost our license if we used them. Industry and academic leadership programs, ground-based conservation initiatives like the grazing BMPs, I don't know everything I need to know about that, but I know it's part of getting your, or maintaining your license. Own the research on this stuff. Social licensing efforts like Target 100, own that stuff. That's yours. That's how you transmit to the public that you've heard their concern and are working on them. By the way, these are action items, not just mouth work items, doing things. A peer groups like Ag Force and Cap Council, be a functioning member of those things as part of doing business. I looked up the MOA, and they have a product advocacy tools page. There are like five things you can do. Holy cow! That's a, it's an encyclopedia of how to engage the public, and it's got tools that they, they can teach you and help you use them. Engage that stuff. Tours and open houses and welcome wagons. How many of you are concerned about the city people moving out to the rural area and bringing their urban mentality with them? In the States, we are. And in a lot of our rural areas, we decided we ought to shut the door behind us. It's okay if our nephews move back or our grandkids, our kids move back to those dinks from, from Sydney. They need to just stay home because they come here because they like it, then they figure out our cow poops. And we get angry at them. We treat them like the enemy until a week after they die. We need to stop doing that. There are people that are going to be moving into your area, the place you call home. You can't stop them unless you want to give up some private property rights that you hold here. So they're coming, and you know why they're coming. But in the old days, what we, what did we used to do with visitors? And in the States, we had a thing called the welcome wagon. When new people would come to our rural area, it was new blood, new ideas. Somebody besides a cousin to marry our daughter. We went the pie. Thank you for coming. Treat the newcomers to your area like friends. Tell them about how it became to be what it is that they love and treat them like a friend so that they don't become an enemy. Help them become an ambassador for your crew. Earth Day, how many of you have ever celebrated Earth Day? I ask you to consider your tour being given during Earth Week. Own that thing. 
We should have never let go of it. Earth Day should be a celebration of progress. So look how far we've come. Does it mean we're doing everything right? No. Look how far we've come. Look at the hope we have for tomorrow. Celebrate. And social media, that is the new backyard. The MLA toolkit becomes a whole learning device on social media. How many of you have Facebook type? Oh, right. You can talk to thousands of people with one poke of the button. I use that stuff. It is our new backyard things. How can I have more hope? Uh, we have a lot of hills that we've got to climb in our rural areas. I have hope for my culture because we did get our license, but we are getting our license back. And my biggest hope is that society is ready. Uh, they, they are tired of the doom and gloom, bomb drum beating, incense burning, planet this dying crap that they've been in for decades. They're tired of hearing what's wrong and ready to start hearing about what can be right. And I know this because of my speaking. It used to be that all I spoke to was the choir, ag groups and forestry groups. And but the last 10 years, I've been asked to address the American Banking Association, legislatures and states all over our country, our county commissioners from all over our country, uh, the municipalities of Canada, people are trying to figure this stuff out and they're tired of hearing the shouting. And they want to hear from real people from the ground that are empathizing with their concerns and can educate them on what's happening that can be right. They want some different choices. They want to choose you, especially the next generation. I got a call from the University of Illinois a few years ago student president asked me if I'd come talk to them on Earth Day. Now, you want a lover on Earth? You're looking for somebody to kill. <laughs> they said, I'd go, and I went. 3,000 kids in the auditorium. They looked me up on the internet. There were picketers in the back of the room calling me some pretty fun names. I gave them a presentation similar to this. I told them the old environmental movement was timely and necessary. It failed to mature beyond a three-word vision and stopped doing that. And then they were sharing planet Earth with 9 to 11 billion other souls stopped doing that wasn't going to cut it. We need a new environmental vision built on hope instead of fear, science instead of emotion, education instead of litigation, resolution instead of conflict, and employing rather than destroying human resources. And the new movements are going to be led by rural people because we live too close to the ground to pretend. And I still get goosebumps because I sat down and the kids stood up and they clapped, and they stomped, and they whistled, and they escorted the picketers out of the back of the auditorium. And I asked the student president, what happened? So I said, I thought my job here today was to get tomato on stage. His direct quote was, our generation is tired of hearing that the planet your generation is handing us as a piece of crap. You gave us hope. The next stop was Dartmouth. Uh, same reaction from the kids. Then Brown, Ted Turner's alma mater, not a bastion of conservative thought. Same reaction from the kids. Now I have a nationwide and in Canada, very aggressive campus speaking circuit, and it's the kids that are requesting it. They want to know that there's hope for their planet. They, they want to know that we're working on answers that they can accept. They're starting for a new, new vision. That's a war. We need to walk through it. We need to talk to them about our vision and how it compares to theirs. We need to be part of their answer. What's at stake in this discussion? What's at stake is your social license, your freedom to operate, both the heritage and promise of your animal culture. I'm going to close with a, with a cultural clue. Uh, I've been at this for a while now, and some people ask me how I can keep, keep up and fight for industry. You know what, if I was fighting for industry, capital I industry, I would have quit 20 years ago. Industry is going to be fine. Somewhere, somebody, somewhere is going to manipulate the environment for the betterment of humankind. People need stuff. We are going to have 9 to 11 billion people, so industry is going to be okay. The question is, are we going to have little I industry, the people who inhabit our industrial flowchart? Are we going to have them in our industrialized countries like Australia and Canada and America? Is our culture going to survive? Is your ranching culture in Australia going to make it? The industry of animal agriculture is going to make it somewhere. Is it going to make it here? And when my butt gets tired, that's the fire that gets going. 
uh, because of what happened in my culture. 30 years ago, or 40 years ago now, we took the Iowa Basics test in Montana. It's a test to tell how smart and young your kids are. And when the principal and teacher got the results back, they called mom and dad into school. And I laid awake waiting for them to get home that night because when the principal calls dad, like as you know, it's about to come to a screaming halt. So I was wide awake. I dad went for over 30 years that I don't heard the conversation, but we lived in a, a mobile home, a trailer house at that time, it had really thin walls. And I heard what he and mom talked about that night. And in our little timber town in northwest Montana, my dad and mom sat in our living room and talked about how to keep me from being a logger. Because they were told that night if I ended up being a logger, it was my dad's fault. Dad got a message. Tens of millions of rural resource workers have been getting a message for generations. And the message was, I had scored high on the Iowa basics test. I was too smart to be a dumb old logger like him. And for the first time in my proud dad's life, instead of looking down at his hands and seeing calluses on his palms and dirt under his fingernails, and that being a source of pride because it built our company, it built our town, it built our state, it built our bloody nation. For the first time in his life, it wasn't a source of pride, it was a source of shame. He understood, he had a heritage that was not worthy of passing on, at least to intelligent children. And he wore that misplaced mantle around for decades. I can tell you when we buried him, I prayed that the mantle was gone. Because so I got to work with him. And when we were standing out in the forest, looking at a hillside of trees, trying to figure out how to apply modern forest management to the hillside, I had to his hand on the wall. Dad didn't have a one, and there was a stupid person standing there, and it was not my father. He had more sustainable environmental information in his brain that came to him through his hands than he could have gotten with a doctorate degree from Yale. But his was experiential knowledge. He learned by doing. And society, for some reason, decided to discount that knowledge base. They continued the discount at their own peril. I have four children and a bunch of grandchildren. I'm a big believer in higher education. All my kids have completed college. We're going to make sure all the little kids go to college. But when they're done with school, they will understand that all the theory talked about in academia is theory. And it floats around in non all land. Some real person takes it to the real world and tries to apply it with their real hands. And what's at stake in this discussion is the culture of production the practical applicators of academic theory. And society can help afford to lose that. If the leading export of our rural areas is our young, well-educated, well-rounded children, what will we be left with? Scary Larry and his idiot brother in a 1952 John Deere tractor doing what? I see a lot of young faces in this crowd. Thank you so much for being involved in the heritage of animal agriculture. It is a heritage that's worthy of passing on. It's not perfect, but it's the best that's ever been. You guys are not perfect. The one thing that society needs to understand is you're the safest, most productive, most efficient, most environmentally sound producers of protein in the history of humankind. And if Australia wants to make a green safe choice about their red meat, they'll want it to come from here. Where that batch from? I'm going to close uh, with a message that mom left me with. I have a tendency to try to eat elephants when they are in the room. I'll have to do this and I'll close with this with you folks. It is from numberless diverse acts of courage and belief that human history is shaped. Each time a man stands up for an idea or acts to improve the lot of others or strikes out against injustice, he sends forth a tiny ripple of hope. Crossing each other from many different centers of energy and daring, those ripples build a current that can sweep down the mightiest walls of oppression and resistance. That was Bobby Kennedy, South Africa, 1966. It's also Beef, Australia, 2015. You don't have to go home trying to be a white. You've got to make a profit with your business to stay in business. You go home committed to being a ripple to maintain your social license. One hour a week, and together, you will be a ripple that will save the last best places and the last best people. And this lover from Montana couldn't be prouder to stand with you. God bless you.
touched every emotion of everyone here in this room. That was incredible. Um, thank you so much for sharing your story. And um, I mean, the key message I got out of that was for all of us as an industry to sell the environmental movement and take ownership of that and really champion that product. So we. So, so just thank you. That was awesome. And um, and now we'll, um, we'll take questions from the floor for a few minutes before we have a panel discussion. And uh, please, let's discuss this a very quick question and answer session. in your, uh, well, first of all, thanks, that was great. It, uh, it did touch the uh, aspect of borders, and I uh, it was a great, uh, great story to tell, and uh, I just hope that uh, we can all go home with, that, with a better understanding of where you should be going. But I have a question for you in relation to your honesty and being honest with the public. Um, this industry of ours has got some, some people, some warts that aren't easy to get across. The, the likes of um, the dehorning issue, the spaying issue, the castration, the branding, things that probably we all do at home and we all understand are important to our industry, but are hard to sell to the, the people in the main street, to the, to the, to the, the, the um, coffee drinkers in the Green Street today. How do we handle that? How do we try and sell that, that that's an important part of husbandry for our industry. And then if you put your finger right on it, you have to, for us, we have to lay all of our practices on the table and, and discuss with the public what they were, what they were looking at and what they perceived what our practices to be. So you need to, to lay your practices on the table uh, and then discuss with the public the what part of husbandry each one of those is. You've got to be able to explain it in those terms. Well, how, do, how do those actions account for what you believe is good animal welfare? Because if you can't package it that way, ultimately they're going to say, don't do that. So you need to, to look You need to look, talk to the public about your practices, figure out which ones are acceptable, figure out if there are alternatives to what you're currently doing. And you've got to, to talk with them. They've got to package it in a way that they understand that meets their concerns. Animal husbandry, that's that's something that I believe you guys ought to be selling to the public. You, you're concerned about your animals. And your practices need to be packaged in that. In forestry, we have to package it in forest health terms. And our practices needed to go down that road for the public to accept them. So we, I need to lay everything. We had to get all of our practices out on the table. I, I, there's going, there are going to be no easy answers to any of these things. And by the way, you aren't going to be active one hour a week for a year and then you're done. Thank God you've got your license back. Sustainability and, and this discussion with the public is going to be lifelong because their expectations, their challenges, uh, the, the questions they have of you are going to be constantly changing. So you're going to have to modify how you address the public based on what they, they're hearing and concerned about. It's a, sustainability is not a destination, it's a pathway. I encourage you to climb on that thing and own it. Don't be afraid to be green. Be the leader of this discussion. An animal husbandry, you should own that. Get the science behind you, get the research behind you, and then discuss with the public why. Does anyone want to know how to get to Lady Montana? They told us Durham is our future. <laughs> <laughs> we think the only way it's going to work is set up roadblocks and take wallets and purses, but <laughs> make people come. One question is about trust. The trust between the industry and once and the environmental industry. I'm happy to be in the head of 
I guess this guy is more of a second bidder. Uh, I'm not a customer. Because you're lying to the cows all the time in Wall Street. That's something I'm going to keep. There are a couple of things there. One of the things that, that we started doing that, that helped us build trust is we started working locally with those that were expressing concern locally because they're generally not conflict driven. So we started working locally with people that were expressing their concerns because they're our neighbors and sometimes they're even our friends and we can build trust with them. And the larger discussions we've got to be at the table with some people, we had to sit at the table with some people that were throwing rocks at us. But we had to be at the table so we could express to the public that we're proud enough of who we are in our practices that we're willing to sit with people that are throwing rocks at us. Doesn't mean we agreed with them. But in order to build trust with the public, they have to sit with them. Some of the people in the environmental movement, we call them the zero cut people, they would never, they will never endorse forestry that includes a chainsaw. Um, they were at the table as well. Ultimately, they ended up being marginalized by their friends, though, because they began to look like the extremists that they were. So we had to find people we could talk with in reasonable terms and sit at the table with them. And that would build trust. And it took time. We're still working on it. But you need to find people you trust in this discussion. And it might be somebody that is currently throwing a rock, but at least somebody that has the right intentions. If they're just wed to the conflict, and when you solve one issue, they're going to invent another crisis to make some more money, you're going to have trouble agreeing with them. And we found locally, most of the folks said that they shared the same concerns we did. So we started at home. Oh, no, I still the camera. Just with them, you know, I'm say, well, we have divisions between um, the state, and probably um, uh, recently when some of our um, groups sat at the table that certain other groups didn't expect them to be there, and that was all information. So how do you get around, you just keep and we had a great deal of that trouble too and it took us a while to figure out that we, we needed to learn to stand together and I understand it's the, the World Wildlife Fund group put uh, by the, the round table discussion and folks the World Wildlife Fund and groups like that, in our case it was the Sierra Club and the World Wildlife Fund, they were involved in forestry as well. That was who the public trusted. Didn't matter. That's We can be angry about that, but we had to sit at a table with them as we discussed sustainable forestry and ultimately crafted a solution. We had to be at the table. Didn't mean we had to be there all the time. We could also leave, but we had to be there to show the public that we were willing to work with who they believed was representing their interests. Doesn't mean we have to always agree, and sometimes we'd walk away from the table. And we'd have to go back, because that's where the public was having the discussion over our license. And in, we had to figure out in our industry how to hold our fights internally. Because for a long time, we aired our dirty laundry outside on the line, and that was destructive for us. And we have a bunch of divisions. We have people that own their own land, people that don't own any land, people that are just loggers like me, and people who own sawmills, and we're always fighting each other. We had to learn uh, that there's a bigger issue out there in our overall social license. And we had to keep our dirt in it inside. We, and we had to, to learn to market our, our ideas without beating up on our allies. And that was tough. We've got to do it. You have to stand. You have to have a common front, a common face. And on the, on the issue of uh, sitting at the table with those, if the public has already vested their interest in those folks, I encourage you to be there. Doesn't mean you have to stay there. Doesn't mean you have to agree with everything that's going on at the table. But you have to be there, even if it's to prove that the process is currently flawed. But you have to be there. Do you have a plan or strategy for the handling media? Handling the media? Uh, social media goes right around the front page. Local media. Your local media? I, they, they're vested in the same concerns as you are. So I would use your local media, I'd use social media, I, 
Uh, we worry a great deal about printing pages and so we worry about the front page at home. Now, we could not change the New York Times. But we found we did that. And on social media, we can talk to millions of people and policymakers without ever worrying about the front page. So I have used the media that you have the potential to have influence and a truthful story to be told. There are lots of fantastic questions and we're getting great, great feedback here, but maybe we'd like to spread on to the panel now and we keep asking these questions. So I'd like to welcome to the stage Howard Smith. Howard is the President of the Cattle Council of Australia. Uh, he and his family uh, run a cropping operation with 67,000 head of green fat and cattle. Uh, not green beef, sorry. It's about 7,000 acres of grain across from the central place that he's held a range of industry positions, including president of Actors Cattle, Vice President of Actors uh, in the Cattle Cans and Marketing Market and Access Trade and uh, a key advocate for the establishment of the Castle Fed Cattle Certification Scheme. So please come on stage power. Ben Strauss, who is current president of the Race Force of Cattle, who runs the commercial breed operation at Harrowlock, near Mitchell, um, for the EU, MSA, and PCAS markets. He's been actively involved in the industry for the last 41 years as a stock agent and a lot of it, a lot of cattle exporter. Uh, he's currently a member of the state government, ministerial advisory Groundtable committee for agriculture. Cattle Council of Australia Chair of Marketing and Chairman and Director of Marriott Kingdom and Harvesters and Growers Company. Through his Atlas Foundation, Anthony is eager to see the export industry develop and carry on producing accreditations and multiply the supply and demand of rare juice and industry tools. So, thank you for coming. Thank you. 
where the developed systems that we can substantiate our clients so that the consumer has got confidence in their own.
but the positive story for our industry, and I guess differing to where Lockheed got to, is that there's just amazingly high levels of trust for the industry at this point. You know, we can specifically turn this area of concern for animal welfare and concern for the environment. And only 5% of people are actually changing any consumption habits for those foreseen reasons. But the majority of people they really trust what it is that, that everyone does. But I guess the risk is if we're not out there continually telling the story, I guess, like we talked about today, laying out some of those practices that we know people may have some concerns with, that over time that, that trust will erode. So the thing is that we're actually in a pretty good position. And you know, whilst there are a lot of concerns around my export, as far as domestic consumption, it's not really translating. Um, I heard you speak about the new Tuttle's verification program, the Tuttle program that they're uh, undertaking in Canada. And one of their uh, criteria was um, the level of producer, the level of uh, which the producer is engaged in the community. So one of their uh, criteria for sustainable work is, is the level of producer engagement in the local community. Um, which, which, you know, I guess you could debate the value of that in terms of producing sustainable meat. What, how do you see the relationship between um, producer profitability and the ability to um, assure and have that sustainability um, assurance in place? Obviously, there are some limits, but there's some other that could possibly produce to produce um, to meet that criteria. So what's the relationship between producer profitability and the degree to which we can illustrate, um, guarantee um, those sorts of assurances, sometimes fuzzy assurances that consumers are going to say that they want. I hand this one to Bruce and say, Bruce, can we run out of capitalism? Lots. I really think that they, McDonald's may be requiring that or as part of their. Uh, sustainable practices for Canada, but what we would find is we, that's got to be part of doing business. We need to have a social conscience in order to, to maintain a social license. And I think Kit's right. I think, I think society has a natural knee-jerk positive reaction toward the producer, but part of our production process has got to include outreach to them so that we maintain that. Because we're growing more and more distant. If, uh, even in your local communities, you if the, if the kids in your school don't live on a ranch, they're getting the same channels as the kids in Sydney, and that distance between production and uh, the consumer, even in our local communities, is getting wider and wider. So I think just as part of doing business, we've got to have a social conscience so that we maintain our social license. And part of that is giving back. Part of that is just doing outreach. Now that weren't available 10 to 15 years ago, and maybe, oh, 
I can tell you that the price of not having that social engagement for us, we have a lot more time on our hands now than we used to. <laughs> so it, it's, I don't know how exactly you juggle it. I do a seminar on Activism 101, how to do it and how to have take over your business, because you're absolutely right. It's a cost of doing this time, and time is money. But somehow, we've got to figure out how. That's why I ask for an hour a week part of that engagement. You can do a lot with an hour if it's, if it's focused. And the MLA tools, there's some good stuff in there. So in effect, what our industry body is sort of built a framework that it's going to be delivered to make it easy for us as producers that that be delivered by us. Yeah, definitely. I think to Bruce's earlier point, you know, no one trusts the person out in front of the building in the city with their button and start off and say, this is how the industry is performing. You know, LA is the service provider, but we work with the industry to identify this as an issue and build some platforms. But ultimately, it's up to everyone in this room to get out there and tell your stories, because that's where the public trusts. And, and as I was saying, there is already that trust there. But you need to be continually out there telling those stories, engaging talking about what practices are actually happening. <laughs> and you don't have to try to be awake. You know, that isn't about, I don't know what the is, but I don't think they expect everybody to have half their business time being out crusading and, and giving back to the community, but some of it needs to be. That's why a ripple, just pick a, a thing. And if, you, if everybody in this room does that, if everybody in animal agriculture in Australia does it, you will be awake, but everybody has to do it. It's got to be part of it. Doing business. And I think it's like to, to, to sell a story. You know, I, I tell a little story that I witnessed myself. Our son and uh, his daughter, uh, sorry, our daughter in law, were pushing the first baby and, uh, in Townsville, and uh, they went out to the barbecue, a uh, lunch afterwards, back at their place. I said, mate, we're going to get good steak. Make sure we're getting this good steak. So we drove down to the local butcher shop, a little, uh, little professional butcher shop, and we walked in, and there's this TV monitor on the wall, right in this, this, this story about um, uh, a couple raising cattle, their family, uh, mustering their family, branding cattle, um, fat cattle, green grass. I said to the butcher, I said, uh, what are you making your, uh, your video? What's, what's it doing? He said, mate, he said, we doubled. We doubled in the first week. People said, I want some of their beef. And that's, and it's, it's a story, it's a good story to uh, to get out there to the public. The public were enjoying that, seeing something that was, uh, you know, it looked like it was well managed, it looked like it was green grass, just, just the, the, the good story. Um, Bruce, thank you very much. My name is Carolyn Lynch, so I come from Vanuatu. Um, I love that um, your story you told. I think what I got out of it is that we need to be proactive about what we do, not reactive, not we've all seen things that we should have, but maybe we've become harmful, maybe we've just accepted that that's what we need to do to make money. Um, and it's not like for somebody saying you can't do that. We should be out there doing stuff, showing them that we're leading the way, not being reactionary. So not that you know the world protection is saying you can't do that. We should be saying we shouldn't be doing that. Yeah, I think uh, figuring out what sustainable looks like for you guys, you're a long ways down that road. You get, believe me, you've got a lot to talk about already. But defining a position that, that answers the public's issues and having that be your foundation uh, where you start to have a dialogue with the public, instead of getting kicked or getting your butt kicking and screaming to where the public thinks you ought to be, define your area in their terms and answering their questions and then be proactive about marketing that. My industry, we got drunk kicking and screaming from goal post to goal post and it didn't go well until we figured out what the public thought we thought they wanted. We defined that position that we were proactive in marketing it. And you guys have a lot of stuff to sell. And the public, I'm from America. You guys are what, what Americans think of Australia. If you ask an Australian to begin to define the, the, what is the culture of Australia, the psyche of Australia, Australians are you. And they, you are an important part of their cultural web. 
but you've got to defend that position by being part of with them. And I, I, you haven't lost your license. As Kip says, you, you're a long ways uh, from, from losing it. But stay engaged with the folks that have uh, engagement as part of your operation. Be proactive. You're absolutely right. So that you don't lose it. The public wants to believe you. But you've got to listen to them so that you're answering. You're not playing reverse jeopardy with them. The sensationalism itself, they look at the news and everything, everything's all doom and gloom. You know? There's no good story on it, but that doesn't sell. Look at the latest Peter thing, you know, they want to shut down the woman's story and they put up some bullshit thing on, on, in the paper, picture, things like that. How can you get our story out there being sensational, sensational to, to the public, for them to believe? It's very hard to get something that's true to be, to be sensational, to keep that sort of, sort of stuff that they just keep going coming back, you know, they go from one industry to the next until, until they just wear you down. How, how can, we, can we do something to, to get the truth out there that people will actually believe? industry social media is not ask yourself when you're reading how many of you read, when you read Facebook on that live stream of things how many of you click on the good news story to watch the little YouTube thing just to feel better in that minute that that's a real we're not going to win the front page of the conflict industry mainstream media but social media that's a that's another world just to comment on that uh, last Peter right? It didn't get a lot of traction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and actually the community came back and agreed with the industry on that because it was too far off. Yeah, no, I think we, we want the public unsilly. You know, they, they don't just take on everything that the figures put up there. So they, they went too far on that one and they just didn't sell. around them and, and, and the public discussions that you refer to for your presentation. 
just interested in all of your views on how the things you apply here relate to that discussion with government and, and the policy makers that, that can be uh, influenced by what goes on around them. Is there anything different about the conversation with them, or is it effectively the same approach? Well, I'm not sure it's anything different in terms of the conversation with them, but I think that the way that we can it's essentially the same approach. They're just people too, and they want to hear from people at the ground level that are actually trying to, to work this stuff out in real time. Uh, what we found is our most effective lobbyists in discussing things with our policymakers were people from the ground. So we, that's part of democracy works, but it's not a spectator sport. Uh, the, the, our Healthy Forest Initiative was got, we got it through our U.S. Congress. Not because our associations were behind it, but because our foresters, our community folks, went to the hill and, and worked with the policymakers. They're just people too, and they, they want to, to hear from the ground. So there's the same kind of thing that an influence in them. Our policymakers have ended up being our best friends in this. Because the, the over regulation, I want to talk about cost. Over regulation is very expensive and uh, can ultimately be, a, be counterproductive for what they really want to have happen on the ground. And they've got to hear from real people about how that's working out at the ground level before they believe it. So our engagement with the policy makers is, uh, gets richer and richer over time. I just want to thank you, that's probably the most uplifting, real touching story in the world. Yesterday at the beach in closing, there was a talk of there okay, being somewhere around the last four different bodies in the industry, and we need to come together as one to create one brand for the Australian beef industry. I just wondering, when you come from in the industry, you're speaking about getting everybody together and creating a vision for one time at the end of that industry. Do you think that we need to be the same? Is it an issue that we have so many different bodies? Yeah. I think if you, you have a number of different bodies that are working towards a common goal. I think you need to be on the same song sheet. That doesn't mean that you all have to be singing the same song at the same time, but you need to be on the same sheet of music. And you, I think particularly you need to be aware that you can market your particular idea without beating up on your allies. We did a lot of that in the timber industry. We ran, in fact, we beat up on some allies. We, we ran a $40 million wood is good campaign. Like that was the problem. It was the highest commodity use in history. It was stuff that sucked. We didn't spend a dime on that, and we spent $40 million beating up on the cement industry, the, the uh, aluminum industry, the steel, all of our allies. So what I encourage you to do, you've got many different entities inside uh, animal agriculture, beef. Make sure you're on the same song sheet. It doesn't mean you have to be singing the same song all the time, but don't beat up on each other trying to market your niche. My second question is, in, in creating that vision, how did you go about finding everybody's hearing and find that something that everybody was singing the same song to? Well, it was, uh, we spent one entire year, and there were six of us that all agreed on things, and we argued over words like help. But it was healthy. It took a year of very hard work. And, and then we had to, to sell the concept to a, to a questioning public because we used terms like sustainable. And at that time, that was a dirty word. We used terms like ecosystem. We embraced it. And at that time, that was the word of the left. You know, the damn environmental thinking. So we had a lot of work to do to get our people to embrace it. And then we had to market it to our policymakers and our leaders. It was a lot of internal work. Do you need one entire sweeping vision? I'm not sure if you, if you need exactly that. Do you need to have the same song sheet? And it was work. People that agreed with each other, probably terms. Good work, though. The, uh, the commission you asked actually gets asked the muscle time as well. We've got the NFS, we've got the CCI, we've got the Air Force, we've got the, the, um, the, the, the ABAs, we've got all these different groups that are around that all purport to do the same thing. We're all, we're all in the industry together, we all want 
follow really. We all need to follow the really to keep ourselves going. We're going to develop our country. We're going to get better watering systems, better fences, uh, improve our genetics. But I suppose I look at our industry today and think, well, it would be great if we had just one point. But when you think about how we operate today, um, I'm out north of Mitchell and I've got a, a local Air Force branch there and uh, we can go into a local branch and we can, we can uh, present resolutions that come through to, to a uh, to cattle board or to, to Air Force and then from that point there, if it's, if it's worthy of this position, we can go on to cattle council. Um, lots of likes of pasture feed and feed cats was, uh, was a resolution that was made here. So I think if you sort of just had the one body doing the one thing, we we'd lose, we'd lose out somewhere. I think it's important still to have the, um, the, 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 the state farming organisation and then that, that leading up into the uh, Air Force General and going on to um, Air Force and then the So it, it is, uh, it's important, like, in my opinion, that we maintain those. Um, you and Murdoch um, talked about it a fair bit at uh, once me one night. Um, he was in the pharmaceutical industry and uh, he said the same thing as you just said. He said, you know, why have you got all these different groups? Why don't you just get one group, one voice, and go to government with one voice? Um, it, 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 it sounds easy, but it ain't, I tell you. It's, uh, we're better off by you know, and engage with the people on the ground. Make sure that we, we understand um, what new people want, what Bruce is saying, we've got to listen, we've got to understand what, uh, what the grassroots means. And, and uh, you know, we're under, uh, and forces are under a bit of pressure at the time. You know, we, we, it's hard to get membership. We need membership. It's, uh, it's an important part of what, uh, of, of our income that we can then service new people. You know, we've got, under new leadership with Grant Mordsley over there at the back of the, you know, really uh, understand the people that, that, are, that are there on the ground, uh, doing their thing, um, understanding we're, we're, we're the same as all you think we are there. We're giving you our time and try and make sure this industry is uh, more vulnerable for us as producers. One more quick thing too with it. As business people, we like to conserve things, so we'd like to congeal everything into one, one manageable unit because it's it's more cost effective. So we, we have that around to match up a lot. And you're going to think of it like this. If you, if you go to a show and you listen to an upper center, it's one lady belting it out, that's, it's pretty music, it's okay. But if you go to a choir and you hear a bunch of people singing, it sounds completely different to the public. So having a choir singing from the same song sheet may be better and more powerful in discussing things with the public than having one opera singer that might miss a note. I wonder, my dear, is there a solution or like the, um, the farmers' markets to say how yeah, that is it as a market to, to factory farmers. What, what's your take on that? My take? Uh, there are a bunch of different agricultural niches just like there are in timber. We have people that do horse logging, and good for them. That works really cool in local logging. It doesn't work for production logging. So there are a lot of different market niches. Farm to fork is really cool stuff. But I live in Montana and I like bananas. So somebody's going to have to do more than farm before fork or I don't get a banana. So what I encourage people to do strongly, in fact, there are organic, there's grass fed people. I market your market niche without beating up on your friends. Sell the positives of yourself without marketing the negatives of your neighbor. So I, I, I think all of those market niches, there's a place for them. Some are growing, that's awesome. Some are shrinking, okay. But uh, learn to market yourself without beating up on your friends. I just, uh, 
So thank you, you've been a wonderful week. I appreciate everyone here on the panel and uh, so thank you much.